This video covers false prediction number 8, the pentadactyl structure found in the limbs of so many animals. Five digits. If there ever was an icon of evolution, this is it. Over and over and over, we're told the pentadactyl structure is powerful evidence, a virtual proof of evolution in textbooks, popular books, nature shows, blogs, videos, and on and on. But it's all false. It also is one of the many examples of why evolution is a religious theory. In chapter 6 of The Origin, Darwin explained that his theory required a religious doctrine to be true. That doctrine was called utilitarianism, which meant that if God created the species, they would be optimized, perfectly adapted for their environment. Now, that might sound obvious, but it isn't. In Darwin's day, the natural theologians argued God could design for non-adaptive reasons like beauty, enjoyment, order, and things like that. So the natural theologians believed God could design the species for adaptive reasons and for non-adaptive reasons. Darwin, on the other hand, was a strict utilitarian. God could only design the species for adaptive reasons. Darwin's theory and evolutionary thought before and after Darwin are strictly utilitarian. Darwin explained in chapter 6 of The Origin that if he was wrong about that, it, quote, would be absolutely fatal to my theory, end quote. That is, Darwin stated that if God could design for non-adaptive reasons as well as adaptive reasons, it would be absolutely fatal to my theory. He then gave some examples of designs that he believed were non-adaptive and therefore God would not have created them and therefore they must have evolved. These examples proved evolution to be true, given that you believe God would not create such things. I mean, why not? It is a perfectly valid argument. If God would not create non-adaptive structures and we discover some non-adaptive structures in nature, then those structures must not have been created by God. Simple. They must have arisen naturally. They must have evolved. It is a perfectly valid argument. It also is a religious argument. It requires and hinges on a religious doctrine. Without the doctrine, the argument doesn't work. One of the examples Darwin gave in that passage in chapter 6 was the pentadactyl structure. In Darwin's day, it was thought that the pentadactyl structure was not likely to be adaptive. In other words, nature was found to be full of all kinds of designs that were perfectly fitted for their purpose and environment. They were adaptive. And then there were things like the pentadactyl structure. The problem was, why would you have the same design for different uses? There it is in the bat, the dolphin, the anteater, the mole, the horse, the pig, the monkey, and so on, where it is used for flying, swimming, digging, running, walking, grasping, and so forth. It didn't make sense that the same common design was used for a range of functions. A common form was reused. The design did not appear to be optimized or tailored for each use. Now all of this was no problem for the natural theologians, as I said earlier. A pattern that showed up across different species was a sign of harmony and order. They appreciated adaptive, specialized designs for sure. But the natural theologians weren't wedded to them. They were fine with the pentadactyl pattern. For Darwin, on the other hand, who was a full-blown utilitarian, the pentadactyl pattern was a problem. There was just no way God would do it that way. God would not create anything not specifically tailored and customized, not optimal, for the material function at hand. Forget about non-utilitarian reasons like beauty and harmony. God doesn't do that. Now, if you look at the figure, you can see that the different bone structures in the different species are highly differentiated. I mean, you look at the horse and the dolphin, I can't see any pattern at all. But trained specialists can, and even that level of inscrutable detail is a problem for utilitarians. There shouldn't be any detectable similarity. This was a very important evidence and argument for Darwin, which he returned to over and over. It was crucial. As Darwin said, if he was wrong about utilitarianism, it would, quote, be absolutely fatal to my theory. I mean, it wasn't as though Darwin had much else to fall back on. He was grappling with a load of really hard problems. There were huge gaps in the fossil record. Evolutionary pathways between radically different species were just very unlikely. There was no way to see how that would work. There was incredible complexity that had to be created by chance. 
And there was convergence all over biology that was very awkward for Darwin to explain. And after 1871 and George Mivard, it was very awkward. So it was not as though everything fell into place. Evolution and common descent were highly problematic, and Darwin knew it. His strong arguments were that God never would have created this world, and utilitarianism in the pentadactyl structure was one of those arguments. Here is how Darwin put it, quote, We cannot believe that the same bones in the arm of the monkey, the foreleg of the horse, in the wing of the bat, in the flipper of the seal, are of special use to these animals. We may safely attribute these structures to inheritance. In other words, common descent. When he says inheritance, that means common descent. We may safely attribute these structures to common descent. And why is that? How is it that we may safely attribute these structures to common descent? How is Darwin so confident here? The answer, because the bones are not, quote, of special use to these animals, end quote. The bones are not specialized. They are not customized. That's it. That's the argument. That's the evidence. Common descent must be true because the pentadactyl structure does not meet with our expectations for how God would create the species. The bones are not specialized. It's all about theological utilitarianism. That's the whole argument. Without that religion, it falls apart. And this religious argument has been an icon of evolution ever since. Here is a contemporary textbook, some material from a contemporary textbook you can see online. The figure description says, all tetrapods have the basic pentadactyl five-digit limb structure. The four limbs of a frog, lizard, and bird are all constructed from the same bones, even though they perform different functions. Did you see that? So first of all, all tetrapods have a basic pentadactyl limb structure. That's the prediction. And then it follows up, the forelimbs of the frog, lizard, and bird are all constructed from the same bones, even though they perform different functions. That's the utilitarianism still there in our contemporary literature. Here's another uh, website you can look at from PBS. The limbs of tetrapods all have the same pattern of bones. Darwin was one of the first to comment that it seems unlikely that this single skeletal structure could be the best one possible for each of the activities it is required to perform in different animals. The explanation for this common structure lies in a common heritage, in other words, evolution and common descent. So there's your prediction again. The limbs of tetrapods all have the same pattern of bones, and then you have the conclusion or the, uh, the evidence here. He was, Darwin was one of the first to point out that it seems unlikely that this single skeletal structure could be the best one possible, utilitarianism. It has to be the best optimized, tailored, customized design. Otherwise, evolution did it. So the prediction is the pentadactyl structure falls into the common descent pattern. Okay, so that's the prediction. Let's look at the falsification because this is all false. Here is a paper from 1990 New specimens of the earliest known tetrapod limbs shows them to be polydactylous. In other words, it's not the pentadactyl structure. The early fossils, the starting point, the base of the tetrapod tree contains animals with different numbers of digits, not just five. The forelimb of one has eight digits. The hind limb of another has seven. Both of these come from the upper Devonian. Um, another one from Russia has six digits and so forth. We challenge pentadactyly as primitive for tetrapods. The form of these limbs suggests early specialization in the evolution of the tetrapod limb bud. Okay, right there, it has failed. Their the, the pentadactyl pattern is not holding even in the early, the primitive tetrapods. We just read earlier how all tetrapods have the pentadactyl pattern. No, they don't. It doesn't fit the common descent pattern as he, they discuss in this paper. And you'll notice the word specialization there. Uh, it suggests early specialization. That was the death knell. That was what exactly what uh, the prediction was based on, that there was no specialization. And there you have it. Here is a paper from 1993. The diverse earliest morphologies known from the fossil record are inconsistent 
with typological concepts such as the fixed ancestral patterns or bow plans, in other words, the pentadactyl pattern that was held onto so tightly, so firmly. Here's another paper. There are many supposed laws of Evo Devo, that's the uh, evolution and, and development ideas. But I argue that these are merely generalizations about trends in particular lineages. I argue that the body plan is an archetype and is often used in such a way that it lacks any scientific meaning. And of course, he's including in that the pentadactyl structure, the pentadactyl pattern that uh, evolutionists had held on to so, so much. That was from 2022. This prediction is now known to be false as the digit structure in the tetrapods does not conform to the common descent pattern. As evolutionist Stephen Jay Gould admitted, quote, the conclusion seems inescapable and an old, quote, certainty must be starkly reversed. This means that evolutionists cannot model the observed structures and pattern of distribution merely as a consequence of common descent. Instead, a complicated evolutionary history is required, and you can see the brown reference in the, the paper linked down below, where the pentadactyl structure re-evolves in different lineages, and appendages evolve, are lost, and then evolve again. So evolutionists are coming up with these very complicated histories where the pentadactyl structure evolves, goes away, then re-evolves. It's doing all kinds of things in different lineages in order to fit the data. Uh, so, so They'll talk about all of these evolutionary dynamics. What's the point is the data do not fit the theory. So they're having to come up with all these epicycles, these patches to the theory. Here's another paper. Our phylogenetic results support independent instances of complete limb loss, as well as multiple instances of digit and external ear opening loss and reacquisition. Even more striking, we find strong statistical support for the reacquisition of a pentadactyl body form from a digit reduced ancestor. So again, the, the pentadactyl pattern is coming and going. Now, when they say strong statistical support, th that's not actually accurate. They're speaking within the evolution paradigm. In other words, assuming evolution is true, then this must have happened. There's no such strong statistical support from a scientific perspective. Uh, skipping down, the results of our study join a nascent body of literature showing strong statistical support for character loss, followed by evolutionary reacquisition of complex structures associated with a generalized pentadactyl body form. Okay, here's another paper. Uh, here they write, here we show dramatic evolutionary dynamism in the gene expression profiles of digits challenging the notion that five digits have conserved developmental identities across amniotes. I'm going to continue through this paper and read several quotes, and then I'll summarize. We report a surprising diversity of regulatory gene expression profiles of digits between species. Our analysis shows that patterns of regulatory gene expression in digits are evolutionarily dynamic. The developmental identities of digits are evolving across amniotes and can be lineage specific. The frame shift hypothesis is an integrative model. It aimed to explain an apparent incongruity. Our results show that any such integrative model will be more complicated than previously presumed. It has been proposed that patterns of digit reduction in theropods might be more complex than is generally assumed. And they say that evolutionists will need a willingness to consider hypotheses that previously might have been regarded as heterodox. Okay, so what does the paper say? Surprising diversity. Limb structure is evolutionarily dynamic. Surprising complexity. Phylogenetic incongruities are observed. Lineage-specific patterns are observed. It's more complex than was thought, the whole problem. And we need to consider heterodox theories. All of this is bad signs for evolution. This is the signs of a false prediction. This is what a failing theory looks like. Okay, so we've looked at the prediction and we've looked at the falsification. What about the outcome? This false prediction about the pentadactyl pattern forces evolutionists to construct far more complex and ad hoc evolutionary histories, introducing internal inconsistency. The venerable common descent model may be employed where possible, but otherwise dropped and replaced with circuitous explanations involving any number 
of de-evolution or re-evolution events of biological structures. Again, this is what a failing theory looks like. Secondly, the pentadactyl pattern continues to be cited as powerful evidence for evolution. After all of this, all of the failures, it's still there. It's easy to find textbooks, websites, uh, all kinds of media claiming the pentadactyl pattern is this crucial evidence for evolution. This illustrates how evolutionary theory is not about the science. The religion is what's driving things. So we have a prediction, we have a falsification, and we have a response, and it isn't good. What does this say about the failed theory virtues that we've been looking at? Evidential accuracy, causal adequacy, internal consistency, internal coherence, universal coherence, simplicity, durability, and fruitfulness. Well, I don't need to go through these in detail. We're failing on all of these. This false prediction fails on every single one of these. And well, it, it just is another example of a failing theory before our eyes. Religion drives science and it matters.